welcome welcome i hope you're having a wonderful day i hope you're staying hydrated because it is very warm today's video is going to be a review of dead silence by sa barnes so this is a sci-fi horror book written by sa barnes i believe that is a pen name um so if i remember what the author's name is because it escapes me now i'll put it down in the description I think I said this when I put it on my TBR, but I'm not much of a horror fan, but I do love sci-fi. And reading the blurb of this book, I was quite excited to get into it. Unfortunately, I would say that I it wasn't quite up to my expectations, but I did enjoy some of it. So first of all, I do want to start with the fact that there is likely to be some spoilers in this discussion just because of some of the things that I do want to get to and some of the points that I would like to bring up. It's probably light spoilers, but I just wanted to put that warning out there. In case you're not a fan of spoilers at all, then I would say this video probably isn't for you. The book opens up and you're following a crew of maintenance workers who are repairing a communications array. There are five people on the team. You have the main protagonist, Claire. You then have Vola, who is the pilot. You have Kane, who I believe is the medic. You have Lords, which is the communication tech. And then you have Nysus, who is the engineer. This is their last mission out to do this work, as essentially they're being made redundant uh, because this work and this repair work will be automated in the future. And so you have this crew on their last mission in space um, doing the repair work. Essentially, the only thing that the main protagonist, Claire, has to look forward to is a desk job. And this seriously depresses her and um, is making her quite worried for her future. Very early on in the book, they kind of set up that the Claire has a very fragile mental state and they um, already let you know her back history, which essentially was that she is the lone survivor from a colony. A colony, which apparently is a word that I can't say, where a runaway plague killed everybody, including her mother, when she was very, very young. I think they say she was about 11. And um, it sets up that she was left on that colony um, for months on end with the dead until she was rescued. So she obviously has quite a lot of psychological trauma based on this fact. And it kind of gives you an overview of a, why she enjoys this job and why she's here, and also B, her interactions with the rest of the crew and her interactions with others. Um, so that's set up very early on in the book. So during this posting, they pick up a distress signal. They have a very brief back and forward about whether or not they want to investigate. In the end, they decide to, even though it's going to make them potentially late with their rendezvous with their other ship. Um, when they do go to investigate, they are surprised and somewhat awed when they find out that the distress signal is coming from the ship, the Aurora. So the Aurora is an ultraliner, um, an opulent cruise ship for the ultra-rich. It was meant to have a very long, basically, cruise around the whole of the solar system, and you had to be exceedingly, disgustingly rich to be able to even buy a ticket on it. Unfortunately, though, the Aurora, on its maiden voyage, went missing in mysterious circumstances and was never seen again. So as a crew, they then again have a brief back and forth about whether or not they're going to investigate, and they decide, as you can probably see coming, that they will go investigate. And this decision is made basically for two factors. First of all, one, curiosity, which I think would be everyone's main point, and two, also, greed, I guess, or not greed, but kind of gain, because they basically say that if they can prove that it is the Aurora and they can bring it back, that they would have the financial gain from a shipwreck, kind of mariner's law. When they get to the Aurora and start exploring, they're basically faced with this horror and the mystery of what occurred. And this first part of the book is just brilliantly written. It's atmospheric, it's creepy, it's slow paced. Where they're doing that kind of initial explore of the book and kind of getting these tidbits and um, small snippets of what happened to the crew, um, it, it's beautifully written. It is pretty creepy. Um, and yeah, I was really blown away by this part of the book. They discover haunting scenes of what's happened to this crew and you really get gripped um, by this deepening mystery of what on earth happened on the Aurora. I was actually reading this while I was away and I think I definitely did get creeped out, but it could have been because A, I'm very easy to creep out, not gonna lie, um, overactive imagination and all that. But um, secondly, also I think it's because I was staying in a hotel. I think where they were exploring a cruise ship that very much sounds when you go from room to room like a hotel, something about that really kind of got me. And there was one point when I was reading late at night and I was like, oh, I'm gonna have to put this down. <laughs> 
However, unfortunately, after all of this amazing build-up that you're getting to this kind of crescendo, the story flips. And this is because of how um, basically the story is put together uh, or structured, and that's because it has two timelines. One is the past and one is the present. So the exploration of the, exploration of the ship is actually occurring in the past, and Claire is basically doing a rundown to her rescuers of what occurred and what happened to her crew and then how she got back to her rescuers. And that's kind of the second half of the book and is considered the present. Unfortunately, an awful lot of the memento of the story is lost at that point because you had all of that build up, but then you're suddenly in this different time area with these different people, um, you lose all of that. And although it does try, it never really builds up in the same way again. The second half is also her returning to the Aurora with a rescue crew to try and understand what had happened to her crew as well as the initial mission of the Aurora because during whatever happened she's lost her memory and is unable to tell her rescues what occurred. This part of the book also brings in themes of corporate politics and kind of big bad companies um, and it kind of starts to lose some of the creepy mysterious vibes and gets very much more into kind of a thriller mode. Um, which is good, but just not kind of doesn't really gel with the first half of the book. The second half though was not a complete loss. Um, one of the things I, one of the main things I did enjoy about the second half was this concept of Claire being a very unreliable narrator. The fact that she can't remember how she got off the Aurora, how she got back. She also can't remember if, or well not remember, but she also can't rely on her memory. Not certain if she had seen a ghost, if it was something in her head, if it was an actual memory or if it's something that she's made up and she was going mad and that was kind of written um, really well and kind of made it very murky about understanding what was going on but in a way that was really enjoyable. Okay so the next bit is going to be quite a big spoiler so if you don't mind light spoilers but do mind big spoilers I would suggest you skip ahead at this point. Um, if you don't mind spoilers then continue. Um, I just really wanted to raise that one of my other aspects that I really didn't enjoy in this story or could have enjoyed but didn't because of the way it was done was the fact that it was hinted at and then confirmed throughout the book that Claire can in fact see ghosts and has been able to see ghosts for quite a long time um, harking all the way back to the um, being the sole survivor on this colony. Now why I think this is an issue is generally because on the Aurora, what occurred there was proven to be a kind of scientific, technological issue. So why have you set up this law but then not used it, is my point. It kind of makes it feel like the author didn't know which way to take the story, so therefore just did both. And I'm not saying I didn't enjoy the explanation or the exploration of the kind of ghost part of it, because there were some really good scenes and good additions because of that. But at some point it kind of felt like the story was fighting with each other about exactly as I said earlier, which route it wanted to go down. And I kind of found that kind of a big disappointment. Why would you set all of that up and then not use it in an effective way? I personally also had a little bit of an issue with the big bad, um, essentially the corporation being the big bad um, and how that was done at the end with the um, essential father figure that she has coming in and then the son of the corporation, um, the prodigal son, um, and then how that was run and which one of them became the big bad um, annoyed me slightly, but I think that may have been a personal issue rather than maybe a, a general story one. There are elements that I really enjoyed in this book, and I would still suggest that you read it if you are into kind of horror-esque sci-fi stories. It has a nice wrapped up ending that works really well, but there is a definite first half, second half um, delineation in this book. All in all, I give this three and a half stars. I don't usually give half stars uh, to books, but I think it's because this one really could have been awesome and didn't quite make it. And that's where I'm giving the additional half star because of the potential of the book. So have you read this book? Um, what did you think of it? Or do you have any other horror sci-fi recommendations that you think that I should read and give a go? Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.